Thank you everybody for joining us and welcome to SL Green Realty Corp's second quarter 2021 earnings results conference call. This conference call is being recorded. At this time, the company would like to remind listeners that during the call management may make forward-looking statements. You should not rely on forward-looking statements as predictions of future events as actual results and events may differ from any forward-looking statements that management may make today. All forward-looking statements made by management on this call are based on their assumptions and beliefs as of today. Additional information regarding the risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could cause such differences appear in the risk factors and M&A section of the company's latest form, 10-K, and other subsequent reports filed by the company with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Also during today's conference call, the company may discuss non-GAAP financial measures as defined by Regulation G under the Securities Act. The GAAP financial measure most directly comparable to each non-GAAP financial measure discussed and the reconciliation of the differences between each non-GAAP financial measure and the comparable GAAP financial measure can be found on both the company's website at www.slgreen.com by selecting the press release regarding the company's second quarter 2021 earnings. And in our supplemental information filed with our current report on Form 8K relating to our second quarter 2021 earnings. Before turning the call over to Mark Holliday, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of SL Green Realty Corp., I ask that those of you participating in the Q&A portion of the call to please limit yourself to two questions per person. Thank you. I will now turn the call over to Mark Holliday. Please go ahead, Mark. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate you joining the call today and uh, giving us an opportunity to review the second quarter earnings uh, with you. I have some uh, items that I'll open up with, and obviously we'll uh, then turn it over for some questions and answers to uh, whatever is on everyone's mind today. But, you know, starting with the quarter, we, uh, we accomplished quite a bit in these three months since our last call with you, we successfully completed several asset sales, a significant joint venture that we closed this morning, an important fee acquisition, over half a million square feet of office leasing, over 2 million shares of stock buybacks, and maybe most notably, a record-setting $3 billion SASB financing of one Vanderbilt. Our first half accomplishments have exceeded much of our earlier goals and objectives, and we are now very well situated to benefit from what we believe will be an even better market environment in the second half of this year. At the beginning of and throughout the year, I shared my optimism with you for a sharply rebounding New York, and when I survey where we are mid-year, I think that optimism was well-founded. With the year-to-date total return exceeding 30% through yesterday's close, Our stock has performed very well as the market is resetting its views of the New York economy after COVID-related restrictions were lifted on May 19th. Average physical occupancy in SLG's portfolio is approaching 25% as tenants are reopening their doors and more and more workers return to the office. Business leaders are now more than ever voicing their strong support, preference, and adherence to continued work from home model, I'm sorry, continued work from office model, <laughs> see a lot of raised eyebrows here, uh, continued work from office model in the collaborative, communicative, and physically present matter. The majority of our tenants are planning for their workers to return after Labor Day, and more importantly, we do not see any material trends in hot desking or shrinking footprints. To the contrary, we see a trend of businesses availing themselves at this moment in time in the market to lock in space and make investments in improved work environments, technology, and amenities as a way of competing for talent and making a compelling case to their employees for work from office. The space plans we are reviewing today uh, that are submitted by tenants as they begin their build-outs have decidedly more common space, amenities, food and beverage offerings, collaborative meeting spaces, specialty areas, de-densified workstations, breakout rooms for privacy, and generally more thoughtful and efficient 
and healthy use of space. Within our portfolio, this has led to almost 1 million square feet of new and renewal office leasing at rents that are generally flat with expiring escalated rents and TI packages that are marginally higher than pre-COVID levels. We are currently tracking about half a percentage point higher in occupancy than originally projected at the beginning of the year. And with over 600,000 square feet of additional leasing and pipeline, we hope to maintain our performance through year end. Foot traffic at our properties has increased considerably in response to a strong underlying New York City business economy, calls for return to office, and a slow but steady jobs recovery. There are about six to 7,000 new office jobs being created monthly, which trend is expected to continue and result in reattaining pre-COVID office employment levels by mid-2022. Interestingly, the job creators to date are being led by information and technology and professional business services, while the greatest amount of leasing demand seems to be coming from the finance sector. Wall Street profits, which ended 2020 with a near-record $51 billion in profits, has already posted $18 billion in profits in just the first quarter. And the big five banks reported a 150% increase in second quarter earnings year over year, and last year was a good year for the banks. There is now essentially a war for talent among large companies and high-growth businesses, a competition that New York City will win given its diverse, educated, and highly skilled workforce and deep talent pool. It should come as no surprise that New York City personal and corporate income tax collections are at all-time record levels of $15 billion and $5 billion, respectively. It is in this economic backdrop, with record low interest rates and substantial investment capital for deployment, that we believe New York City is situated to outperform other major markets on a near and long-term basis. Looking forward into the coming quarter, we've got many milestones and achievements uh, that we are busy to, uh, you know, to be able to uh, report positive uh, movement on on the next time we speak, such as retur- uh, making ready for workers returning to the office after Labor Day, completion of demo and all the column reinforcement for the commencement of vertical construction next month at One Madison, the commencement of marketing all of the residential units at 185 Broadway will begin next week. Uh, the commencement of full demolition of 760 Madison Avenue, now that we just received our DOB permit uh, to make way for the new Giorgio Armani retail boutique and condominiums. We have planned additional asset sales that we uh, expect to achieve in the third and fourth quarters of the year, with uh, much of the proceeds going towards additional stock buybacks consistent with the original plan, and uh, certainly and maybe most excitedly, the grand opening of Summit One Vanderbilt on October 21st. Um, it's something that we've been working on for three years, and we fully uh, expect and hope it'll become one of the uh, top performing and most visited experiential attractions in New York City once it opens. And uh, that now is well within our sights and uh, looking forward to the opening of Summit. So with that, I would say uh, the third quarter financial results um, were all in line. Uh, Second quarter financial results were all in line with, um, you know, our expectations. And uh, we're happy to open it up now to take questions on any of the specifics. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone to withdraw your question. Press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Caitlin Burroughs from Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Oh, hi. Good afternoon. Um, You commented on the first quarter call that lease concessions um, had stabilized, and it appears from the fine leasing data you provided um, that this was indeed the case in the second quarter. So just wondering if you could go through what you're seeing on the concession side. Have they stabilized, and are they perhaps even improving yet? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't, I certainly don't think they've improved, but uh, they've stabilized. You know, we saw a stabilization starting in the fourth quarter of last year, and that's carried forward, forward through today. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's very important that when you look at the numbers quarter over quarter, you really need to dig into it and understand the, the complexion of the deals that are signed in any one particular quarter, whether heavily weighted towards raw space or space that's been retrofitted, um, renewal deals versus new deals. But on balance, what we've seen is TIs for raw space, long-term deals, um, uh, generally in that 110 to 130 range. That's been consistent for the past uh, uh, six to nine months. And free rents anywhere from 12 to 14 months, uh, typically for new deals, inclusive of construction time. And then obviously, you know, depending on whether it's a renewal deal or a shorter term, uh, duration, then those concessions can be uh, uh, dramatically less than, than raw space. Yeah, I would, Caitlin, I just want to add to that. Cause, you know, I see a lot of commentary about TIs and, you know, what the brokers are saying about <clears throat> TIs. I would caution in a couple of ways. One, uh, you know, brokers talking up uh, the book for their client tenants saying TIs are going up and up is, I, I think you have to be, you know, you have to be very discerning when you you look at that data versus, uh, what we disclose on a quarterly basis. Matt can take you through the actual TI disclosures for the uh, quarter, but on a half a million, on over half a million square feet of leasing, our TIs were, you know, I, I think relatively efficient. And as I said in my commentary, at, at you know, at or marginally above pre-COVID levels uh, for both, you know, new and renewal deals. And you know, we don't buy up rents, so you have to uh, TIs have to be talked about in connection with the rents. Our rents, which I also said in the commentary, are marginally flat with previous escalated rents. Uh, those rents could be higher if we bought the rents up with more TI, and uh, that is, that's a strategy that some of our competition will do. It's not good or bad, it's just, it's not what we do. We, uh, we meet the market on rents and we try and keep the TIs as efficient as possible. And, you know, you have to look at the two in tandem. So, uh, for, you know, for, the commentary out there to be on these, you know, vastly escalating TIs, I think you have to compare it to what we actually have done for the quarter in the year. Matt, can you sort of re review again what, what those numbers are? Yeah, so we, we uh, reported last night that for the second quarter, uh, this is all excluding the one Vanderbilt leasing since the numbers are, are dramatically different at one Vanderbilt. Um, on the rest of the portfolio, you know, TIs were $17 a foot, and that compared to a significantly higher number last quarter. But to Steve's point on, you know, never look at quarter to quarter because it depends on the buildings and the spaces and also the blend between new and renewal. Um, you know, we had a significant portion of our leasing this quarter, renewal leasing, and the TI there was almost zero. Um, on one lease, it, it was zero, 100,000 foot lease. On the new leases, it's $59 a foot. Um, so it's it's a blend every quarter um, for the for the year. Our you know TIs on on the uh, comparable space is is forty dollars a foot, uh, and that is pretty close to the historical average, maybe may marginally higher, and all dependent on the blend between new and renewal and what building's releasing it. Got it. Okay, thanks for that. And then maybe just a question on uh, one Vanderbilt. You guys have clearly made um, a lot of progress there on leasing up. So just wondering if you could give some comments on uh, the rents there and how the rents and concessions are trending uh, relative to your underwriting and versus uh, recent quarters. Well, you know, it's you know the, the trending is it's it's basically we're almost we're almost stabilized. We're at about ninety percent leased. Uh, we have a couple of leases in pipeline that we hope to get done in the next one to three or, you know, one to three weeks or so, bring us over 90%. At that point, uh, obviously, we're going to work hard to get to full occupancy, but, uh, uh, you know, we'll be very selective uh, about how we finish off essentially the top of the building, those two or three or four floors at the top, um, which are, you know, higher rent floors and very special floors, and we're so far ahead in terms of velocity, uh, whether, you know, that may be a 22 event, we'll see, I mean, hopefully sooner, but certainly we haven't planned for sooner. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the NOI uh, and the rental levels are right on top of underwriting, maybe 
certainly slightly ahead on velocity, probably right on top on economics. And, you know, we've gone through every December what those uh, underlying assumptions are, what those NOI goalposts are. We're trending towards the high end of those goalposts with an expected uh, NOI at stabilization, I think, of close to $215 million, I think, is the, uh, you know, is that 220 Yeah, between 200 and 215 between 200 and 215 million, depending on you know which year you pick, but that that's in the next uh, you know two years or so. So um, you know the 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 valuation of that um, of that stream of flows supported a uh, five billion dollar plus appraisal and a three billion dollar uh, financing execution, uh, and you know we're it uh, it closes out the chapter pretty much on what was uh, you know just a. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a transformational project for the company. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Alex Goldfarb from Piper Sandler. Your line is now open. Oh, thank you. Hey, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so two questions. Uh, Steve, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, with everything that's gone on, you know, we're reading articles about, you know, Delta variant and companies like Apple delaying return to office. You guys obviously are pretty active on the leasing front, but the gap of the leased rate versus occupancy, you know, has, has widened. In your, vo- in your view, in totality, when do you think the market will have, will stop the negative absorption? Do you think that's, you know, that at the end of this year, do you think that's 22 or do you think it's going to take longer than that? Boy, um, I mean that's so speculative, Alex. That I, I don't, I don't think I'm going to venture a guess as to like exactly when we turn. I, I will say this: I think the trend line, I think the general consensus uh, from our position and supported by the brokerage community is that uh, the first quarter of this year, uh, the market hit its bottom, and the trend line is that with increasing velocity and a strong economy and an expectation of, uh, of tenants and employees reoccupying the spaces uh, um, after Labor Day that, you know, uh, it, it's sort of all green lights at this point as far as the market repairing itself. How long that process takes, I'm not, uh, that's a crystal ball I don't have. But, you know, from our position as we sit with a portfolio that's well leased and well positioned in the marketplace, uh, I think that will outperform uh, the market in total, and certainly our experience at one Vanderbilt and what we're seeing in the rest of the portfolio would support that expectation. Okay. And then on the asset sale front, uh, can you guys just give an update on the Kenneth Cole uh, site? Uh, I think you guys had, had potentially looked at that maybe for a life science conversion, whether you guys do that or sell it. Uh, we had heard from just, you know, conversations that perhaps the site, you know, would be a – could be conceived as a last mile warehouse site. So can you give just sort of your sense on that? Cause it seems like that could be uh, a potential source of some meaningful dollars. Well, it is in a life sciences corridor for the city and we're in the process of, uh, you know, applying for a ULERP on the site, uh, which would be a significant uh, increase to the potential square footage of that asset. And, you know, at the same time, we had a sale process that was uh, ongoing and continues, and we're evaluating offers for the asset through that sale process. So, you know, it's a, it's a uh, small asset for us, but one that is getting a lot of focus just because it's in an, an area of the city that's uh, very hot right now. And we're working, you know, on a couple of different options to try to maximize value there. Eddie, Andrew, you think that's a, a second half? resolution or that spills into next year? Well, the ULERP would be an 18-month process. Uh, so I'm not sure if it'll be a resolution in the second half, you know, a sale or joint venture, or if we decide to hold it and take it down the ULERP path, it'd be a longer-term redevelopment asset. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Lewis from Truist Securities. Your line is now open. Oh, thank you. Um, my first question, I guess following up on something that Alex asked about, you know, as I talked to investors today, I heard a lot about, 
you know, Apple pushing back their, you know, their return to office and a lot about the Delta variant. Um, you know, maybe maybe help us set the goalposts. You know, I, I heard this concern that, you know, post Labor Day, you know, maybe it becomes a bust if everybody starts pushing back. I mean, maybe help us, you know, what's the expectation for physical occupancy post Labor Day where you would say, you know, things are trending in the right direction versus, you know, you know, what that number might be that, that could cause some concern, you know, kind of an expectation post Labor Day, what the, what the office um, physical occupancy would look like. I, I you know, look, I, I don't think we're in a position, uh, and I think that's what Steve said in the last, uh, to Alex as well. Um, you know, we, we survey our tenants. Uh, we've also seen larger surveys, like there was a Goldman Research Survey that surveyed a much broader swath of tenants. And I think we can only speak to what the current expectations are. Um, but, I, you know, I, I don't know that we can modify those expectations by what a Delta variant, you know, may or may not portend in the fall. Um, th- there's the, the consensus in the reports which is echoed by our tenant base, is very decisive, whereas 80% of workers expect to be essentially back to a full work week uh, by no later than early 22, starting in earnest after Labor Day. And that's kind of what we've been saying for six months now. Uh, You know, the work week was never five days a week. The work week was kind of, you know, four, four and a quarter days a week, four and a half maybe, and that may shrink to an in-office work week to like 4-0 or 4-1. There's, there's, there's no, there's no uh, narrative within our portfolio where we speak to people going to, you know, five, four, three days a week at home. Uh, it really, and this is what we said on the last call, uh, is more – in the nature of might there be floating uh, work from home days uh, and flexibility built into a schedule, but it doesn't reduce desks and it doesn't more importantly reduce the recognition by the business leaders you see, notwithstanding Apple may want to push back their uh, return by a month, but if they push it back by a month, they push it back by a month. The commentary you're hearing from us is commentary you should think about over a period of years to come, not, uh, uh, um, September versus October, because that really has no bearing on our performance or portfolio. Uh, if you know, we'll be prepared for return for workers more robust than we have today, come right after Labor Day, because that's what our tenants are telling us. Whether the Delta variant is going to cause that to be delayed by a month or so, I don't know. But even if we did know, it really wouldn't change anything we're doing here at. The, you know, in our business, and I don't think it would change anything that tenants are doing for their five- and ten-year long-term planning because that really is evidenced by the ink on the leases, which was a million square foot of leases done in the first half, 600,000 pending. Everybody's fully familiar with the Delta variant. I mean, no, this, I don't think it's a secret. Uh, everyone, you know, knows it's out there, and we're going to take precautions against it. The incidence of COVID in our portfolio as um, – as um, you know, workers have returned is, is almost you know, I'll say none to negligible. So, so we, you know, I, I continue to maintain the safest place to be is in healthy offices which have policies and protocols in place. And you know, where the spread may be taking place, it's not within the SL Green portfolio. That I can tell you. And I don't think it's going to cause people not to return, uh, you know, to offices. New York City is about 60% vaccinated. Hopefully, that number goes up. I think the office population is more highly vaccinated. If you take our office as a uh, as a as a, uh, uh, a barometer of that, it's much higher than 60 percent. It's higher than 80 percent. So um, we're just not in a position to comment on Delta variant, but we are in a position to say that everything we see in here leads us to believe that businesses are uh, awaiting um, you know the opportunity to get everybody in and that the plans are to commence in September. Michael, I would just add, we're signing leases, many leases, with companies that are not back in the office yet. So are the people you're talking to saying those people are signing leases and never coming back to the office? 
<laughs> no, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at lease velocity. Yeah. So, you know, look, if, if there, you know, the, the, the tenants, I, I think business leaders have spoken. There's no, there's no illusion that, uh, this, this, that, that Fortune 500 companies are going five days a week work from home. Uh, and for those that do, I think they'll competitively suffer. But that's, that's okay. my opinion. Um, that all makes sense and actually answers a couple of my questions. Maybe I'll ask, okay. you know, um, I, I think we're, we're about one year out from the, the reset on the ground lease on 625 Madison. I know you've been asked about this from time to time. I, I don't know if there's any update or indication of, you know, what that rent increase would be, but also maybe the timing of when we'll know um, what, what, what that will be. No, no update in status there. You know, the rent, the rent reset is uh, the middle of next year, and the rent will be known before then, but there's no update in status there. Yeah, I would say, you know, we're actively engaged in, uh, you know, with our team on, on the, the process surrounding the rent revaluation. So the process is underway. Uh, the team is hard at work on it, and it is about a one-year process. That's just the way, the way it works. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Blaine Heck from Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Great, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, probably from Mark or Steve, um, I wanted to follow up on some of the nuances in the return to office, if possible. Are you guys seeing any major difference in the pace of the increase in utilization or, or physical occupancy between newer, higher quality buildings that have better overall office environments versus you know, more commodity buildings that, that maybe weren't really updated much during the pandemic and may have less of a, an energetic feel for, for lack of a better way of phrasing it. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that tenants, uh, tenants and their employees um, are gravitating towards better quality buildings with better, healthier work environments, um, which is why you've seen in our portfolio Certainly at one Vanderbilt where we're, you know, we're starting to see the tenants on board as they finish their construction, but throughout the rest of the portfolio where we've put so much effort into upgrading air filtration with, you know, MERV 14, 15, and 16 level of, of, of filtration such that it produces, you know, the healthiest work environment possible and enhanced cleaning and other protocols that we've implemented. Um, but, you know, on a, as, as it's, as the months have gone by, essentially we've seen uh, almost a 1% increase in physical occupancy um, as each week goes by. You know, last week we were at 22% occupied uh, throughout the portfolio. And, you know, two, three months ago we were as low as 11%. So it's, 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 there's, a, there's a wave of tenants that are coming back and their employees are coming back. Uh, but clearly, you know, they favor the healthy, the healthier buildings, and their employees want to see it and feel it. Great. That's helpful, Steve. And, and maybe one more quick one for you. Um, I know it's uh, still somewhat early in your process, but can you give us any, any color on the interest from prospective tenants at, at One Madison? I thought I heard Steve. I would say that for where we stand in the, in, in the deal, um, in, in the development, which is three plus years ahead of completion, relative to that same point in time on one Vanderbilt, uh, the interest level, the early interest level is far higher. Um, you know, large tenants are the ones that are, um, you know, moving fairly decisively within, you know, just a small selective band, I think, of competitive properties uh, that can meet their needs for end of 2023, beginning of 2024 move-in. Um, obviously, we have 1.4 million square feet um, to offer, but the beauty of One Madison is we've got sort of, you know, building within a building. We've got uh, 93,000 square foot podium floors that are relatively more affordably priced. And then we've got state of the art, um, 
you know, even more efficient um, tower floors at 35,000 feet that appeal towards a different segment of the market. So we're seeing activity on both right now. Uh, we're seeing activity, I would say, in a volume ahead of what we would have expected from large tenants over three years out from, from completion. Um, I would say that some of the interest is not, you know, is fairly sign- serious interest in terms of uh, uh, people taking hard looks and, um, you know, uh, even uh, some paper being passed back and forth. So uh, with that said, uh, we have no anticipation of signing a lease in 20. One, it was not in our guidance. Uh, We really, I think, on the numbers we had uh, put out there in December, had talked about mid-second half of 22. So I would say that where we sit today, I still feel very good about that guidance. We'll obviously try and exceed it. Um, And based, the most importantly, based on the early feedback, I think we have the right product. It's the right product in the right area with the right amenity mix uh, that I believe strongly is going to be leased and is going to be leased consistent with our projections. So, um, you know, the early feedback is good, um, and I'd say we're, you know, marginally ahead of where we expect to be, but I wouldn't think that's going to translate into anything announceable in 21, uh, nor, nor did we expect it to. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Manny Corkman from City. Your line is now open. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't know who this one's for, maybe Mark, but uh, on the sale of 220 um, East 42nd, did anything change in the market that um, made you want to JV that rather than sell it outright as you had planned to uh, a few months ago? Uh, you know, Andrew, why don't you – I mean, you know, that was entirely I, – I was resolved to own it long term. Uh, so, Andrew, why don't you sort of you – know, the evolution of how we uh, got to where we got to, which was, a, you know, again, an above average, above expected execution. I think the – we were able to achieve, you know, a price that was equivalent to the pre-COVID price if you adjust for the deposit that we retained on the sale. Um, and – we're pretty optimistic about the prospects uh, for the building because it has a great base of very long-term lease space and some low-rent rolling space that, you know, I would say our view for that, the prospects for that space has, has gotten more positive over the last couple of years. So, you know, whereas it was a price we were willing to sell, uh, we're quite happy to hold 50% of the building. We got great financing done. Uh, you know, last April, May on the asset, and we just decided there was there was upside in, in the rent roll that we wanted to continue mining. I think, it, I think it's another great uh, data point about the uh, global appetite for, you know, well-positioned midtown real estate. Um, you know, it's a sizable deal. Um, I think it's it's reflective of this disconnect between a private market that really is is looking for yield, you know, looking for high credit uh, yield, which obviously the news building affords. Um, it's, as Andrew said, very well financed. And, you know, in this market, there seems to be no shortage of capital that wants to deploy into deals like that. Um, so, you know, good good data point for the market, uh, good data point for our portfolio. And, you know, I wouldn't take it in isolation. I would combine that with the success we achieved at 1,200 a foot on 635, 641.6, and the deal we did at the end of last year at uh, 4, 10, 10th, you know, which was nearly a billion dollars for, a develop, you know, a, a newly completed asset. And, uh, you know, a plethora of other deals that we've, you know, started and finished in a, uh, you know, in a post-COVID world. Uh, thanks for that additional color, Mark. Just, just to dig into your, your point on um, capital out there for a second, do you think that there's as big an appetite for 
taking out whether it be a larger single asset or um, a, a larger portfolio of assets, or do you really think that the, the capital sources today are focused on sort of more um, you know, swallowable single asset uh, deals um, that don't take that, that larger commitment of capital? Well, I, you know, just to put some meat on the bones, you know, larger, smaller, it's, you know, I, I think the largest, uh, I, I think the largest investments, uh, you know, for single assets, maybe small portfolios, is in that check range of 500 million. I think is a sweet spot for large deals. I think if it approaches a billion, you start to, you know, thin out very rapidly uh, as to uh, who can write that check. And it's not, it's not commentary. I don't think on the attractiveness of the opportunity, or maybe even the desire. It's just that. You know, billion-dollar-plus checks are, um, you know, rarer to come by, and anything between 500 million and a billion will normally take care of even the largest of New York City assets on an outright purchaser JV. And you know, to aggregate up buildings to make a portfolio deal, um, you can do it. And for people who can write that check, I think it's an enormous opportunity. There's just less people and less groups that can handle it uh, at those levels. Thanks for that. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Frank Lee from BMO. Your line is now open. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first question is for Steve. Um, can you provide any additional color on the 600,000 uh, leasing pipeline? What's the breakdown between you versus renewal, uh, what type of tenants are in the pipeline, and if you're able to provide the average lease term? Um, so we have 355,000 square feet of either leases in execution or or in negotiation, and another 264,000 square feet of uh, term sheets, which we think have a high degree of probability of conversion over to a lease. And of the leases that are out, um, there's roughly 300,000 square feet of, uh, of new tenants and about 30,000 square feet of, 35,000 square feet of renewal tenants. And then on the term sheets, uh, it's roughly 200,000 square feet of new and 68,000 square feet of renewal tenants. And then as far as the complexion of the, the, the tenants, um, with the leases that are either out or out for signature, uh, 39% of the square footage is uh, are legal tenants, legal law firms. 29% are financial service tenants, and 17% are uh, tech tenants, which by and large mirrors what we've seen uh, in leasing velocity year to date. You know, little flip flop on the uh, on legal versus financial services, whereas financial services has clearly led the market to date, but. In our pipeline, we've got one larger uh, law firm deal that's, that skews that, that data a little bit. But I, you know, just to broaden the, the answer a little bit, I'd say you know where we're seeing most activity in the marketplace is uh, financial services throughout the portfolio. We have a disproportionate number of leases, maybe not total square footage, but disproportionate number of leases that are out with financial service tenants. Okay, thanks. So it sounds like the majority of the leasing pipeline is coming from new leases. Um, do you have a sense of what's driving this? Is, are these tenants looking to upgrade space or just simply looking to relocate? Yeah, I think you've seen, you know, across the market, you've seen um, a pivot by tenants that have sort of moved away from uh, the short-term renewals, not to say that there aren't short-term renewals, but, you know, there's a lot more activity with tenants that are making long-term new lease commitments as they, you know, get back to business as usual, uh, looking to create new work environments, restack, you know, change the densification of how they operate uh, their companies. And, you know, tenants are going more on the offensive where they're, you know, they're not just hibernating in place, scared of, uh, scared of the world, but now that they're getting past COVID, they're getting back to business as usual, and, and that velocity is picking up, and that's why we're seeing more relocations. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Steve Sakwa from Evercore ISI. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks. Um, Mark, I was just wondering if you could comment. I know leasing spreads bounce around quarter to quarter, and same story in Hawaii is, is, you know, choppy and can have some unusual comparisons. But, you know, your your leasing spreads year to date are only down maybe 1% or 2%. I know your expectation was down 5 to 10 at the investor day. And same store on a wide growth is a little weaker than you had projected. So do you just have any comments about the back half on either of those trends and anything that may be playing out uh, as expected or, or better than you thought? Well, I mean, again, we don't – I look at everything over the course of a year. I mean, we, we budget based on the course of a year. We do our reforecast, which we just finished up, based on the balance of the year. And on that basis – uh, we feel like most of our goals and objectives, we are either on track or maybe hope to exceed. Um, I mean, there's 18 of them, so, I, you know, I'm just, you know, in, in, in general, uh, there, may, there are obviously going to be ones that were stretched we may or may not hit or we may miss by little, but I'd say by and large we're on track or ahead. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, whether we're a couple of points above or below in July, uh, we have our numbers run out through the end of the year. I think mark to market, we're pretty much on track, uh, you know, with that or maybe slightly ahead of, uh, uh, of our projections as with velocity. Uh, Matt can address the same store. Um, yeah, same store. You know, like, like the other metrics, we are on, on a full year basis, uh, on our expectations, maybe slightly ahead. Uh, you gotta remember the first half of this year is comping to mostly a pre-COVID comp in the first six months of last year, uh, whereas the last six months will comp to you know, post-COVID uh, last six months of last year. So the, the comps will be better, uh, and that'll trend us what looks to be off from our expectations in the first half of a year. That'll put us back on our expectations for the for the back half of the year. The other thing I would say, and I, I alluded to it earlier, um, you can't really just look at the rent because you gotta got to take that capital into play. I think we're probably ahead on net effective relative to budget uh, because our capital in Q2 um, – you know, was down. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, we sit here talking about, well, you know, is, is TI up 30%, 20%, 10%? 10%. I, you know, our TIs were uh, down in the second quarter. Now, they may be up again in the third and fourth, and, you know, we feel like for the full year uh, we're on or ahead of schedule relative to what our TI capital budget was, meaning, you know, within uh, our TI capital budget. Uh, a little hard to do quarter to quarter, but we certainly – are not experiencing the trauma on concessions that I read about in all the tenant broker reports. And I just think you have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Okay, thanks. Second question, you, you alluded to bringing more assets uh, to market the second half of the year. Can you just maybe help frame out sort of the potential size um, or, you know, bucket of asset sales? And then, you know, the, the corollary to that is obviously share buybacks. I think we're much stronger in – Q2 than, than certainly we thought, and, and we thought it would be a little more back-end loaded. But, you know, how do we think about asset sales back half of the year and, and share buybacks back half of the year? Well, I mean, I would say we're, we're reviewing our business plan based on uh, the success that we've had with the assets we've rolled out to date and the fact that the, the appetite out there is voracious for New York City assets on a – you know, relatively quick closing basis. So it's, uh, you know, we're re re-examining the art of the possible for the second half, and we definitely will be back active in the capital markets. Just can't dimension exactly how large at this time. Uh, share buybacks Matt can speak to, but... Yeah, and consistent with what you've seen us do in the first half of the year, uh, you know, the bias is to use proceeds from asset sales for share repurchases. We only do share buybacks with the proceeds from asset sales. Um, but we have uh, taken the opportunity to pay down debt to keep the leverage levels in line um, with some of the asset sales, too. So to Andrew's point on, you know, dimensioning it, depending on what the dimension is and what that does to the balance sheet, again, our bias is to buy back stock with the proceeds unless we need to pay down debt to manage that leverage level. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jamie Feldman from Bank of America. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, Steve, I was hoping to get a little bit more granular on the leasing pipeline or at least kind of the, the segments of demand. I mean, I think everything we've seen is that, you know, the most active 
tenants in the market, and certainly you guys have had success at One Vanderbilt, have been that kind of higher end boutique type financial services law firm. You know, as as people are thinking about getting back to the office, how should we think about that next group? You know, kind of maybe larger tenants, but not quite as high end. You know, what are they looking for? Is it still a focus around Grand Central? Do you think that they're going to look at other parts of the market? I'm just curious what think like kind of that what stage two is going to look like in terms of you know, New York leasing picking up after the pandemic? Well, I think maybe a couple other sound bites to round off the, uh, the, the color commentary on leasing other than the very specific percentages I gave on the last answer. Um, you know, I, I think we're seeing certainly more focus on transit-centric located buildings, uh, certainly more focus on buildings that are amenitized, and a focus on buildings that have a healthier workplace environment. Uh, the good news in all of that is, by comparison to the first half of the year, we're starting to see more tours, proposals, and uh, leases in negotiation on the kind of smaller uh, tenants in the market. What we saw in the first half of the year were a lot of activity on the premier buildings, the Class A product, but now we're starting to see life for the smaller guys and the more commodity buildings. So in our portfolio, if you use Gray Bar as a good example of that, we've got a lot more leasing activity in that building than we have uh, in the first half of the year, which I think, you know, one one that's in prior market disruptions, it was always the small guys that stayed busy, the big guys put out of the market. This is the first time in my career where I remember that the big guys were the ones driving the market. Um, and, uh, and the small guys were on the sidelines. But I think as we're getting past COVID, those smaller commodity guys are now starting to awaken and come back into the market. And we're certainly seeing it uh, in our Grand Central portfolio in, in some of the more commodity type of product, like a gray bar or 7-Eleven Third Avenue. Okay, thank you. And then, um, I mean, now that we know who won the the primary for mayor. Um, any thoughts on what Eric Adams would mean for, you know, New York real estate, uh, you know, some of the concerns around crime, uh, maybe cost uh, operating costs for landlords, any, any early read? Well, there's, there's still a general election, you know, to go in November. So, uh, you know, Eric looks uh, very well positioned, um, you know, to become next mayor. But I think, you know, when you speak to him, he still has work to do before, uh, you know, before that's mission accomplished. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, in a more broad context, um, you know, looking at uh, increased voter turnout, there was like an extra 150,000 voters uh, than usual in a city that doesn't have high voter turnout to begin with, I think demonstrated um, the uh, positive results of activism within the resident and, and business community to get people to get out the vote to make sure that all voices were heard and not just a, you know, a segment of the voices heard. And, you know, the top two leading candidates were both considered, uh, you know, moderate candidates, candidates who believed in uh, safety and, you know, affordable housing, but, you know, in working with, uh, you know, businesses uh, to create an environment that is, um, you know, that will be favorable for the next four years. And, you know, I think that was a major uh, and positive step forward. And I think Eric's going to do uh, a great job if he, uh, you know, when, if and when he becomes mayor. And um, I think he, you know, we've seen him in the past work through Difficult land use issues and other issues in his uh, in his borough in Brooklyn, and we have respect for what he brings to the table in a total package of uh, being able to uh, work with the policing and security community, uh, the business community, the minority community, um, the homeless, and and people who uh, you know uh, are in the uh, you know need the affordable rent. Um, segment of the market, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, you know, continuing to have good relations with City Hall and do our part more than anything else. You know, we want to do our part to 
you know, help improve transportation, infrastructure, the built environment, contribute towards affordable housing like we did with Sky and 185 Broadway, and we'll do everything possible to support him and his administration, just like we have with uh, Mayor de Blasio and his administration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Craig Mailman from KeyBank Capital Markets. Your line is now open. Hey, everyone. I know, um, you know, lease terms have been kind of elongating from the contraction you saw early in the pandemic, but are, are any tenants looking for more flexibility in terms of early outs in some of the longer leases they're taking? Is that, you know, something that's taking hold or not a conversation? Well, I, I, you know, whenever you've got a, a market where the tenants feel that they've got more leverage than they had uh, previously, then one of the things they go for as part of their overall negotiation is just greater flexibility. I don't think that's driven by COVID, post-COVID, state of the economy, a different perspective on on on, uh, on the real estate market. It's just that, you know, tenants – Come, come to the table asking for a lot of different components on their transactions. So, yeah, you know, we're seeing requests for more flexibility, uh, whether it's to shed space midterm or cancel early. But ha having said that, the number of times that we actually acquiesce to it and, and, and give that kind of flexibility is still very, very rare. It's, it's not a foregone conclusion that just because you ask for it, you're going to get it. Okay, that, that's helpful. Then just on the, the one Vandy financing, um, you know, after you guys repaid the, the billion seven fifty that you had out, um, what can you just talk about the excess proceeds, how much of that needs to be kind of retained within the J V for anything laid out in the the C M B S docs versus um and and how much if any, is kind of being returned to partners as excess proceeds or return to capital? Sure, it's Matt. So, you know, the at closing, we had about a billion five and a half uh, out on the construction financing. We repaid that. And then after reserves, uh, first costs, and then uh, predominantly reserves for, you know, executed leasing, TIs, uh, free rent, that type of thing, um, $650 million was repatriated back to, to SL Green. Uh, which then went to all pay down debt. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Anthony Paulone from JP Morgan. Your line is now open. Great, thanks. Um, so I guess for maybe Mark or Andrew, uh, with the valuation you got on OVA, uh, where do you think that puts land values and, you know, what does that you for your appetite to pursue, you know, other potential large-scale projects or even, you know, even teardowns for that matter? Uh, well, there, there are some, you know, some other sites trading around Grand Central or in the market at least. Um, and, you know, I would say that's indicating uh, strong, strong land values in the Grand Central area, um, we, we, you know, just just specific to Grand Central, um, we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, I, I think the biggest impact to us is really One Madison, where, you know, we're, we're very confident with the decision we made with that asset, and think we have a chance to, you know, replicate or exceed the success we've had on One Vanderbilt with one Madison. So uh, that, that's where it sort of impacts us the most, I think, more so than taking on another large scale development uh, in this immediate area, because we sort of have one ongoing at one Madison. Okay. Uh, and then just my second one is maybe for Matt. Um, can you give us any guideposts or, or any additional colors we think about FFO from 2Q to 3Q with the, uh, you know, I think the Latham and Watkins, I don't know if they're moving out or not, or if they're uh, holding over, and just how to think about that as we roll the numbers. Sure, yeah, Latham and Watkins left in uh, June, 
uh, end of June was the, the expiration of their lease. So they're out. Uh, that asset will move into, you know, redevelopment phase now for the for the balance of the year. Um, you know, FFO is somewhat a function not just of NOI but of the other things that we have in the business plan. So um, depending on the timing of things, you know, the third quarter could be, uh, you know, equal to or, or slightly below the second quarter, um, and then fourth quarter pops up, um, or or the inverse of that. Um, we have some things, you know, in the pipe that are timing dependent, and whether or not they uh, they happen in third or fourth, we're indifferent to, because as we said earlier, we're given you know annual guidance. We don't look at stuff on a on a quarterly basis as long as we're within our annual guidance and we are squarely within our, our range as we sit now. Just to, just to add to that, you know, Latham and Watkins, when we took control of the building, we knew that they were, they had already signed the lease to move out of the building, so it was no sh surprise to us. So when we bought the building, we bought it with the intention to do a redevelopment plan, and that plan's now been fully designed and is in the early stages of beginning to execute. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Vikram Malhotra from Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks so much. Matt, Matt maybe just uh, sticking with you uh, on not necessarily the SFO, but you know, from one Vanderbilt, can you just clarify or give us the sort of gap contribution you've baked in uh, for each quarter, the third and fourth quarter? Uh, and then what's your expectation for the summit in the fourth quarter? So in, in sticking with the commentary so far, I won't give quarterly guidance. Um, but I will stick with my annual number of, you know, low 30s gap NOI contribution from uh, from one Vanderbilt for 2021. Um, our summit numbers, you know, we're open in October 21st. Uh, we have, you know, modeled in very conservative ramp. Uh, so the contribution for the for the back half of the year is is very light. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then just on, uh, you know, in the street retail portfolio, can you just clarify or give us more color on 85th Fifth Avenue? I think it showed 100% occupied the prior quarter, but not this quarter. Um, can you just clarify what, what went on there? Shouldn't it be the opposite, though? No. Did you say 100% occupied or 100% vacant? No, it was vacant this quarter, so last quarter it was fully Angel occupied. Angel yeah, Angel Angel yeah. Right, I guess, I mean, we, signed, we signed the lease yesterday for the space, all of it, <laughs> a long-term lease, so the next quarter will reflect occupied again. Yeah. Anthropology's lease expired. Left. Who is it? Is and it they the, left, and we, we signed the lease. Vikram, uh, Vikram you're taking wind out of the sails for third quarter, <laughs> forcing us to... Uh, forcing us to go. We, we, we just signed a full building lease on that uh, deal yesterday. Okay, so so, you got to leave so, something so. on the bones for Q3, my friend. <laughs> so the street retail is fully leased back, leased back up, and um, with leased, leased again, no worries. Okay. Any 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 uh, comments or any color on the economics relative to where it was prior? Do you know where bread is? Uh... We'll, we'll we'll talk about it more. You're using your third question of two. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll talk about it more when we uh, when we reveal the deal. Okay, Next so, sounds good. So, I, I just have uh, so we I get that color offline. Just one clar one sort of clarification. You talked a lot about you know capital, obviously buybacks in terms of their capital de deployment, the um, uh, all the developments that you're doing. But just in tying with your commentary about you know New York coming back near term, long term, you know one of your peers formed a big JV uh, to focus on their market, but but also look at more value add type development uh, or, or type acquisitions. I'm just wondering your appetite from here on, on, you know, on focusing on something like that or value add buildings in terms of acquisitions, but also just given the debt markets growing the DP, DPE book from here. Well, uh, we are very actively, uh, you know, pursuing and desirous of, you know, not just value add, we're, we're, you know, full, full on, ground up development opportunities. Uh, we have value add opportunities we've acted on recently like 885 third, which is I think a great example of that and now well underway. Uh, 750 thirds are redeveloped within the portfolio. Uh, we have other deals like that in pipeline. We closed a DPE deal in Q2. We just 
you know, yeah. our cl yeah. closing, you know, we, we have other pipeline for Q3. We expect to close and be able to discuss on the next call. So, I mean, we're very much in business. Uh, you know, we've got like seven active development deals and redevelopment deals going on right now. We have fairly active pipeline of opportunity, but disproportionately, just given the, you know, extreme divergence of value and stock price, we, uh, we've decided to allocate most uh, free cash flow towards the stock buyback and we'll continue to do so. Okay, fair enough. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Nick Ulico from Scotia Bank. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, page page 38 of the, on, on the lease expirations. I, I just had a question there. You know, if you look last quarter, it was talking about there being 450,000 square feet of expirations in the second quarter. You still listed over 400,000 in this quarter. And so I'm just trying to understand what you know, it looks like you have now additional month-to-month um, -month tenants in the portfolio, and you know maybe you can provide some clarity on that and how much of this is office versus retail. Wow, uh, you're in the weeds on that one, Nick. But uh, so I'll, I will say there's you know holdover tenants from quarter to quarter, so that'll probably contribute to it as to the complexion of it. I, I don't know that one off the top of my head, so I can uh, I can research it further and get back to you offline. Okay, appreciate that. Thanks. I, I guess my other question is just, um, you know, as we think about the, the leasing activity that's in the pipeline that you know Steve was talking about earlier, and then we relate that back to you know page 29 um, in the sub where you do give you know the the occupied number for same store versus the leased number, and you know that that spread is converged closer, meaning that you know you used to have, you tend to have a higher lease number than an occupied number. You still do, but it's not as big of a spread. I mean, are we, I'm just trying to think about that, that leasing that's in the pipeline, um, you know, what that means in terms of your, you know, lease number in the, in the same store portfolio. Is that, is that going to be additive to that? I think we addressed that earlier in saying, you know, we are still comfortable with the goals and objectives we put out there, including occupancy, uh, and would hope to exceed our goal, which was 93% uh, by the end of the year. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thank you. At this time, I am showing no further questions. I would like to turn the call back over to Mark Holliday for closing remarks. Okay, well, I uh, appreciate the opportunity for those still on to discuss uh, all that we accomplished in uh, Q2. It was a great three months. Uh, we'll be working hard these next three and look forward to speaking to you again. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.